This is Module 2, Lesson 4, Part 1 on Measures of Position. Measures of Position are also known as Measures of Location or Measures of Relative Standing. It kind of depends upon the textbook author or the researcher that you might be reading or dealing with as to what they call it. But Measures of Position can be used to compare data values from different data sets, even if they have different uh, measurement units, such as if you were looking at weights and you had one data set that involved pounds and another data set that involved grams. You can also compare data values within the same data set and also measures of position are used to help determine if there are any outliers within a data set which can influence um, your other statistical measures. There are two primary measures of position that we're going to consider. In part one, we're going to talk about percentiles, and then in part two, we're going to talk about the Z or the standard scores. So let's talk about percentiles first. Percentiles are position measures that um, are used quite often within the education fields as well as health-related fields. You'll see them in other things like criminal justice or psychology, but the two most common ones are education and health-related fields. Um, a percentile divides the data set into 100 equal-sized groups so that each group contains 1% of the data. It allows us to compare an individual data value to the national norm. For example, whenever you if you take the ACT math test and you score a 25, when you get your score report back, um, it may indicate that your score of 25 is in the 90th percentile. What they've done is compare your value, your score, to all of the other students who took the test on that particular date. So we can actually use the percentiles to compare how an individual does to, to the population or to the national norm. Percentiles are symbolized, or the notation that we use is the capital letter P, makes sense, P for percentiles, with a subscript of 1 up to a value of 99. That simply indicates which percentile you're interested in. If you have P with a subscript of 2, that means you're looking at the second percentile. P with a subscript of 15, you're looking at the 15th percentile. The main thing you want to focus on is how to interpret a percentile, and a percentile is interpreted as the percentage of data values that fall below the specified rank. Go back to our ACT math example. If your score of 25 is in the 90th percentile, that means that 90% of all the people who took the test scored below 25, which is really good um, because that means you scored reasonably high in comparison to the other folks who took the test. One of the challenges though with percentiles is that there's a variety of formulas that can be used to actually calculate it and a lot of times it depends on the researcher, depends on the author of the textbook or, or um, other things like the nature of the distribution. Is it bell shaped? Is it skewed? Um, and so forth. So we're not going to get too caught up in all those different formulas. We are going to focus on the interpretation, but we're going to look more specifically at a special type of percentile called a quartile. A quartile um, is a value or a number that separate the data into quarters so that each piece or each division has 25% of the data values. Now your quartile, as well as your percentiles, may or may not be an original data value. It's okay if it's not. I've listed here how to interpret each of those, but I want to see if I can also sketch you kind of a diagram of what you're looking at when you're thinking about percentiles, what we're doing. You would have 
your data and we would put them in order from the minimum up to the maximum and then we're going to divide that data into four separate groups so between the minimum and that first tick mark is that would be quartile one and that grouping contains 25 percent of the data between the first tick mark and the second tick mark which is the median or the second quartile there is an additional 25 percent between the median and the third tick mark which is quartile three you have a third 25 percent and then finally, between Q3 and the maximum, you have the final 25% or a total of 100%. So it's sort of like a number line and you've divided it up into four equal parts. The interpretation would be for quartile one, 25% of the data falls below quartile one while 75% above. Second quartile, which is also called the median, you would have 50% below and 50% above. Third quartile, you have 75% below and 25% above. Within this, we also look at um, the relationship between quartile one and quartile three. Um, that represents the middle 50% because you have from quartile one to the median is 25. Then from the median to quartile three is another 25 or a total of 50. This region from quartile one to quartile three is called the interquartile range. And it represents the spread of the middle 50% of the data and the interquartile range is used to help us to determine potential outliers. The formula for calculating the interquartile range which is abbreviated IQR is quartile 3 minus quartile 1. Now let's talk about outliers for a minute and then see how we can use the interquartile range to help us to decide if there are any potential outliers within a data set. An outlier, if you'll recall, is a data value or possibly values that for whatever reason just don't seem to go with the rest of the data. They're very different from the other data values. They're either really, really low values or possibly really, really high values. You may think, well, why would there be an outlier? There are a variety of reasons or a variety of things that can cause um, an outlier within a data set. It could be a measurement or an observational error. Um, you just mis misread the measuring tool. Um, you misread an observation. It could be a recording error. When you go back, you can't read your handwriting or you mistyped it or you recorded it incorrectly. And and you have no way of fixing that at this particular time. Um, it could be that you have a response from a participant that doesn't belong to the defined population. Think about the shoe store example that we looked at earlier. We were selling only men's shoes. And if we had a response from a female or a woman, that really wouldn't fit because the defined population was men and that could be um, considered an outlier. It's also possible that the outlier is actually a legitimate, true response that occurred by chance. Um, and then we have to have a way to document that. Or we have to also document if it's occurred because of a recording error or whatever. But so we always want to think about, do we have any outliers within our data set? Because those outliers, those really, really low numbers or really, really high numbers can influence the calculations of the measures of center, like the mean, the median, the mode, as well as your measures of variation, things like the range, the variance, and the standard deviation. So here's the rule or the guideline for um, determining whether or not you have an outlier, and then I'm going to try to show it to you in a, on a picture as well. 
So the guideline says any data value that is less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR or any data value that is greater than Q3 minus 1.5 IQR is considered an outlier for the data set. So let's kind of go back to our picture for a minute. You have our minimum, you have the maximum, oops, let me go up a little bit further, okay, and then we have it divided into our four pieces, and remember each piece has 25%. This is Q1, whoops, sorry, let me see if I can erase that. Okay, got it in the wrong place. Let's see if we can erase it. Okay, here's Q1. So let me go back to my pen. Okay, so here is Q1. And then over here is Q3. And our calculations tell us we're going to go Q1 minus one and a half times the IQR. So when I do that, it's like I'm going from this point over here and I'm creating a fence. At this point, here is Q1, excuse me, bounced off on me, is Q1 Q1, so you have a fence post there. Then if you go to the other end from, and you go from Q3 out to one and a half, again, what you've done is you've created this fence post. So what we find is anything that is beyond this point here, anything that is outside of my range that I've created or my fence post that I've created is going to be an outlier. Okay, so anything outside these blue lines would be considered an outlier. We're going to see in the next video how we can create a graph called a box plot, and a box plot will also help us to see those outliers. But the main thing is, is to remember this formula, okay, anything less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR or anything bigger than Q3 minus 1.5 IQR is going to be um, greater, is going to be considered an outlier.